What if the Dwemer never vanished? What if that pivotal moment during the Battle of Red Mountain thousands of years ago never happened? That moment where in an instant an entire race of elves disappeared from the face of Tamriel. Just like that, poof, gone. Welcome back to Fudge Muppet, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Scott, and today in this alternate history experiment, we are looking at what would have happened to the timeline if the Dwemer, also known as the Dwarves, never disappeared. Before we move on, a quick disclaimer. I understand that in reality, due to things like the butterfly effect and all that, the slightest changes would make the world ridiculously different with innumerable variables. But for the sake of this fun alternate history experiment, we are going to assume things go on with relative normalcy. So we will still have an Elder Scrolls timeline that is somewhat recognizable, but also, to keep it spicy and entertaining, we are going to have to take a few liberties when it comes to creative decisions. Now we have the ground rules set, let's get down to it. So where do we start? Well, it may be helpful to understand the context surrounding this mysterious disappearance. So I'll deliver a simple rundown. During the Marathic era, the prophet Veloth leads a new elven people called the Kaima to a place called Resdane, aka modern day Morrowind. They get here and start a new society that would one day become the civilization of Dunma that you know today. Also here are the Dwemer. It's unclear what their origins are and also unclear when they arrived in Resdane. Some say they were even a split of the Kaima, but perhaps their arrival was after a period which is called High Velothi Culture. You see, after this period, the Kaima experienced a mini societal collapse. They were reduced to clans and tribes that lived closer to that of the contemporary Ashlanders. They still had towns and villages, but from descriptions, it would seem that the Kaima were nowhere near the golden age of Dunma civilization that would follow. Among them were the Dwemer subterranean strongholds. But to make matters worse, the Skyrim conquests occurred under the leadership of King Vraga the Gifted and Morrowind got swallowed up by the Nordic Empire. This occupation lasted for nearly two centuries, but luckily a common enemy can bring even the most opposed factions together at times. Year 416 of the First Era, the First Council is formed with the leaders of the Kaima and the Dwemer at its head, Indoral Nerevar and Dumak Dwarf King respectively. Together they team up and drive the Nords out of Morrowind, which creates a time of peace and prosperity for all of Resdane. However, one such faction of Dwemer called the Rorkin Clan was disgusted with this alliance and they left Resdane for a new land to claim, a land called Volenfell modern day Hammerfell. Centuries later, the War of the First Council would erupt, which began due to a variety of factors and incompatibilities between the two races of elves, but chief among them was the profane attempts of the Dwemer Lord Kagranak to create their very own god, the Numidium. The climax, which is the Battle of Red Mountain, is an incredibly complex event, mainly because of the actions of the Dwemer. You see, in the real timeline, Kagranak attempted to activate the Numidium in seemingly an act of desperation. And as a result, a dragon break occurred. For those who are unaware, the gist of a dragon break is it's a time altering event, a period where time breaks and simultaneously several versions of the same event occur. And when time fixes itself into a single timeline again, when it stabilizes, then all those versions are reconciled into one timeline, making it a weird situation with multiple truths or half truths kinda. If you want a more in-depth explanation on dragon breaks, there is a link in the description below. But back to the Dwemer. One side effect of this activation of the Numidium is the simultaneous disappearance of all the Dwemer instantly, including the Rorkin clan of Volenfell and the Dwemer of Skyrim. However, one known Dwemer escaped this fate as he was in the realms of Oblivion during this time. His name was Yegrim Bagan, and he features in Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. But regardless, their disappearance has remained a mystery for thousands and thousands of years. But in this alternate history experiment we are concocting here today, the Dwemer 
never disappear. If the Dwemer never vanished, then Kagranak must have never tried to activate the new medium. If it was never activated, then time doesn't break. So what we are left with is the Battle of Red Mountain. And somehow, through all the crazy time bending and various versions of events, we need to try and discern a single outcome for the Battle of Red Mountain. And of course, we are going to have to indulge some creative liberties. So here we are, year 700 of the first era, the Battle of the Red Mountain. In this alternate timeline, how does it go down? The Tribunal's take on the event will have no place here because they will never reach divinity. So the teachings of the Tribunal Temple will never say they quote, achieved divine substance through superhuman discipline and virtue and supernatural wisdom and insight. In this alternate timeline, I think it would prove most interesting if Indoral Nerevar dies in battle against his old friend, Dumak Dwarf King, in the Dwemer stronghold at Red Mountain. Vivek, Almalexia, and Sotha Sil are fighting outside at a standstill, but when news reaches them of Nerevar's death, morale is shattered and the Dwemer manage to push the Kaima to the south. The Ash King Wolfarth with the Nords leads an attack, but is repelled by the Dwemer. In the months following the Battle of Red Mountain, the Kaima are forced to retreat further south into southern Morrowind. The Kaima themselves are fractured. Vivek is believed to have died in a last stand against the Dwemer in a following battle up in the north, Sothasil disappears from the histories, and Almalexia remains leader of House Endoral, but the Kaima alliance is fractured without their Hortator Nerevar. Many Kaima disperse and seek other lands, essentially going into exile. Followers of Almalexia hold on in southern Morrowind for years, but eventually she is taken by grief into the mad god Sheogorath's influence. She goes in insane and throws herself into a ravine, which further decimates morale of the remaining Kaima. Dumak Dwarf King had an opportunity to eliminate some fleeing Kaima who were leaving into Eastern Cyrodiil, but out of some sentimental respect for his old friend in Doral Nerevar, he lets them go. Another consideration is that of the Dwemer in Skyrim. You see, the Dwemer here had their Falmer slaves, blinded by toxic fungus and forced to serve a life of slavery. In the real timeline, the War of the Crag takes place at around the same time of Red Mountain. It's the war where the Falmer uprising occurs. But after decades of conflict, the Dwemer disappear and the Falmer are free to dominate Blackreach and beyond. However, in this alternate timeline, with the Dwemer never disappearing, the Falmer uprising is eventually quashed and the Falmer are forced into slavery once again. So let's have a look at this alternate timeline's Tamriel by the year 800 of the First Era, a century since the Battle of Red Mountain was a Dwemer victory. This is just a rough map to get the gist of territories at the time period in this alternate timeline. Obviously, borders here and there would have more specific variations and some things you just can't see from a top-down view, such as the subterranean occupation of Skyrim by the many Dwemer of Blackreach and beyond. But I did show that Markarth and its surroundings have been firmly secured by the Dwemer. As you can see, we have the Breton kingdoms of Hyrock who have been free of elven occupation for just over three centuries at this point. You have the Elysian Empire dominating Nibine, but due to the uprising of Rislav Larik, we have the foundation of the Colovian Estate Block, a confederacy of the Colovian Kingdoms. We have Black Marsh, which is having a much better time thanks to the fact that the Kaima are not enslaving them anymore due to their lost power, and the purple patches on the map are tiny refuges of Kaima who have fled Resdane, which by the way is the name that remains in this timeline instead of Morrowind. Skyrim is in a similar state to the real timeline, except for the existence of the Dwemer in Markarth, and also beneath their very feet in Blackreach. Somerset, Valenwood, and elsewhere should look pretty similar for now, but you may notice we have the Rorkin clan of Dwemer sitting pretty in Hammerfell, or as they call the land, Volenfell. Some kingdoms of needs and settlements of various other natives are spread throughout the land, but the presence of the Rorkin clan is going to drastically change up some events. You see, in the real timeline, in the year 808 of the First Era, the Regatta shows up. The Yakudans flee the destruction of their homeland and the Warrior Wave carves its way through Hammerfell, making themselves a new home. 
However, in this alternate timeline, we have a problem. The Rorkin clan is still here, and they've been thriving as a Dwemer society for centuries by this time, rather than magically vanishing as they did in the real timeline. So this means when the Yakudans arrive, they're going to have quite the battle on their hands. Let's just assess the changes that could have happened with the Dwemer themselves in this time. You already know about the armies of Dwemer automatons that they have at their command, and you are probably also aware that through their finest craft lords' skills with tonal architecture, they are able to create vast subterranean cities and metals that are strong and never degrade. They can manipulate the very nature of physics. To clarify, this is not every common Dwemer, but the finest among them. They also engineered airships, as seen on Solstheim or in use by the Empire during Tiber Septim's conquest, and on top of that, they were able to telepathically connect to one another through the Calling, which was originally believed to be an innate ability, but upon more discoveries, it seems they used headgear called a mitre, which allowed them to talk over vast distances and share thoughts. So we are dealing with a physics-bending, long-distance communicating, city-building, robot-army-wielding group of elves that have additionally had another 100 years of growth. I believe that the Dwemer under Dumak Dwarf King and the Dwemer of Volenfell may have reconciled to a degree with Dumak's admittance that they were right about the Kaima. It's also likely that the new Dwemer control Controlled Resdane may inspire more alliance and cooperation between them all, including those in Skyrim. Perhaps we would start to see the construction of underground tunnels, connecting the Dwemer strongholds of Volenfell, Skyrim, and Resdane, creating powerful, exclusive trade routes. Additionally, we have the Craft Lord Kagranak still carefully working on the Numidium, crafting themselves a new Dwemer god, because in this timeline, he is not rushed by the Kaima Dwemer conflict. I'll talk more about that soon. As for the Rorkin clan themselves, they, according to the law, exploited the land's plentiful mineral resources with massive mines and workshops which would only add to their industry and technological advancement, but what's interesting is that they were not entirely isolationist and did partake in trading relationships with neighbouring Bretons and Elves, likely referring to the remaining Dereni or perhaps Aelid survivor groups. Now, the Yakudan Regatta fleet arrives on the shores of Hammerfell. They may initially overwhelm an above-ground Dwemer settlement or two and establish a small foothold, but what I imagine would go down is one of the most terrifying battles to ever potentially exist in the Elder Scrolls. Yakudan sword singers with their mighty spirit swords carving through automatons like a Jedi carving through droids, but at the same time, many are crushed beneath the feet of Colossi and pierced by mighty ballistae or slammed by by the mighty Dwemer Lord wielding Volendrung. The sands of the western coast would run red for a while, but I believe with such a powerful force of the Rorkin clan contending them, they would not be able to successfully claim Hammerfell. The Red Guards may instead use a strategic mind and assess the possibility of waging campaigns elsewhere and claiming different lands. The closest two options are High Rock to the north and Somerset Isles to the south. Now, if the Yakutan forces had any form of scouts or any way to assess the power levels of the two potential enemies, enemies, then clearly fighting the Bretons of High Rock would be the easiest option. However, for a bit of fun and also because they may first assume that High Rock also belongs to the Dwemer, the Regatta quickly seeks out a new campaign against the Elves of Somerset. The Yakutans only have a bitter distaste for Elvenkind due to their experience on Yakuta with the Sinistral Elves. This hatred could easily apply to the Dwemer as well, but I believe the Rorkin clan would just prove too entrenched and resourceful to be successfully conquered. So let's say the Yakutans manage to settle the chain islands Kaspar, Hearn, and Stross Mackay. From here, they make war on the High Elves of Somerset, landing on the northern shores of the island. From here, there is another conquest, and I'd wager that the Yakutans, especially with their Ansai sword singers, would be able to be quite successful against the High Elves. But after initial landfall and Ford bases were made on the northern coast, a very powerful Altmerian navy would likely break their supply chain to Stross Mackay and the other islands, slowly withering the Red Guard forces. But I'd even wager this assault could last years. 
but ultimately I just think the Yakutans would be unsuccessful, especially since they withered their forces by attempting to conquer the Duema first. So as a result, I think the Yakutans would eventually be pushed from Somerset at great cost to the Ultima, and they are forced to the seas and their small islands. I'd even suggest that they would take the island of Sturk as their own and perhaps have settlements along the south of Hughes Bane. However, the vast fleet's numbers dwindle from two failed invasions and lack of resources from the islands to support them. The following waves of migration are met with misery as the Natutambu, or Yakuta nobility, arrive to only find the isles of once noble sword singers that have since resorted to lives as pirates by necessity. From this point onwards, in the alternate timeline, the Abbot and Sea would be plagued by Redguard pirates, some of which wielded mighty spirit swords, an edge which ensures their survival. They depend on piracy to support their population, and not a year goes by where the coasts of High Rock, Hammerfell, Somerset, Valenwood, or even Western Cyrodiil experience raids. Somerset may have survived this, but it makes things rather problematic for them. The High Elves have always had to deal with the Marima raids from Pyandania to the south, but now they must also contend with Red Guard sword singer pirates to the north. The Sigic Order plays an important role in weaving powerful storms as a defense along the northern coasts. Ultimately, this change of events would weaken the High Elves over the long term. But let's discuss the changes for Volenfell right now. With no regatta, we also don't have a big diaspora of fleeing orcs heading north, so the resulting Orsinia might be much smaller or take a bit longer to grow. But at the same time, the orcs could flee north due to an ever-expanding Rorkin clan, but also the star-worshipping Duraki needs of Skyreach will live on instead of being wiped out by the regatta. So let's say the orcs flee all the same to High Rock and they found Orsinium. What's interesting is potentially the orcs may be able to carve out a much stronger foothold for themselves when you consider that the first siege of Orsinium was a combined effort of the Breton kingdoms and the Red Guards, specifically the Order of Diagna led by Gaiden Shinji. But the Red Guards never settle Hammerfell and they therefore never team up to destroy Orsinium. So in this alternate timeline, it's likely Orsinium is founded but only grows in strength, with the Breton Kingdoms unable to defeat them by themselves. In the long term, this would likely lead to a weaker High Rock, and when we look at the other human societies of Tamriel in this alternate timeline, it seems to be a recurring theme. In Skyrim, the Dwemer hold on to their territories and persevere, causing future disruptions for the Nordic inhabitants, who, if takes problems with the Dwemer, can be besieged from the east, west, and beneath their very feet, especially with the construction of tunnels connecting all of the Dwemer clans. The Nords would likely live a much more fragile existence having to compete with that. The Elysian Order of Cyrodiil would likely crumble in the War of Righteousness, as it did in the normal timeline, and High Rock would never become part of the Elysian Empire due to Dwemer territories, the Clovian Estates, and the Nedic Duraki Kingdoms all forming a series of barriers. Consider the whole reach of Skyrim is under Dwemer control at this point. But speaking of the Need Kingdom of Star Worshippers, I thought an interesting alliance may occur with the Dwemer, at least a temporary one, based upon shared fascination with the stars. I propose that the Needs may eventually praise the Dwemer as an elite who graced them with advanced technology that allowed them to research the stars better. I'm talking about the great Dwemer Ories and astrological research they undertook. As for the Needs, it's either play nice and look at the stars with cool Dwemer tech or get pushed out of their homes, so I think we know what they'd ultimately pick. Before I discuss the Numidium, I'd like to discuss the potential of a Dwemer Empire, or at least some form of clan confederacy. A Dwemer unification to the point where they begin making moves to rid occupations of the grounds above their cities, and additionally use new technologies and tonal architecture to radically change the Tamriel we know. I think with the power of the Dwemer at this stage in the timeline, I think it's fair to assume that over the course of the First Era, which is yet to continue some 2,000 years, is we would have a very powerful Dwemer presence, perhaps presided over by a council of craft lords. Have a look at this map, showing off an alternative Tamriel by the year 2200 of the First Era. As you can see, we have the familiar Somerset Isles, Valenwood, and elsewhere in control of the High Elves, Wood Elves, and Khajiit respectively. 
Argonia is independent but has its territories encroached on. But of course, the biggest difference is the Dwemer Empire, who now officially rule over the lands of High Rock, Volenfell, Skyrim, and Resdane, the largest empire this alternate Tamriel has ever seen. Within this empire, there are various Nord, Need, Breton, and Orc vassal townships and settlements. Those who do not follow the word of the Dwemer become enslaved as the Falmer were. Men who couldn't live under this regime fled to Cyrodiil. High Hrothgar is now a giant Dwemer observatory with airships coming and going delivering precious cargo at the skyport next to it. Tunnels connect every single subterranean Dwemer stronghold like an interconnected train line where they have constructed magical hyperloop type structures that can deliver passengers miles away in minutes. Technology has advanced in leaps and bounds. Automatons are the backbone of almost every industry. To the human of Tamriel, this is a hellish landscape of brass. Cyrodiil is home to the last refuge of man. Needs, Bretons, and Nords work together to resist the Dwemer. The Elves and the Khajiit to the south are far too disinterested in the affairs of men, but they simultaneously seek ways to preserve their own power against the rivaling Dwemer. A key part of this wild success of the Dwemer was most certainly the successful activation of the Numidium. Kagranak did it without breaking time and without making his whole race disappear. The Numidium was then used to defeat all who would not bow to Dwarven will. It is this time in history where things are looking particularly grim for the rest of Tamriel. But the year 2200 throws a spanner in the works, a small opportunity for some to fight back, perhaps a moment of resistance. This year is the year the slow to release the Thracian Plague upon Tamriel. And when you consider the rapid transportation of the Dwemer Empire, the plague rapidly takes the Dwemer civilization by storm. Of course, the Thracian Plague does not discriminate between man or elf, but it is in this moment in alternate history where the other races may have a chance of survival, a chance to resist and rise up against the Dwemer. The Thracian Plague would likely devastate the Dwemer Empire, at least for a time, but before long, with all their advanced technology and tonal architecture, I'm sure they would find either a way to cure it or to mitigate its effects. Consider that by having underground cities, sectioning off and quarantining certain areas would be potentially much easier when you are working with tunnels and corridors as opposed to wide open lands. And you also have automatons as proxies to administer medical care or enforce quarantines. The unfortunate likely scenario is that the other lands of Tamriel get hit the worst. Cyrodiil, the last bastion of mankind, becomes rife with crime and panic. Valenwood, Somerset, and elsewhere are devastated and totally absorbed in their own welfare. Argonia is reclusive and potentially mostly unaffected. So what's the response? There is no Bendu Olo in this timeline to assemble the All Flags Navy. Well, you either have a fleet of airships that carry the Dwemer who employ powerful weapons against the Coral Kingdoms of Thras, blowing them into the sea, or perhaps the Numidium marches along the ocean floor to Thras and destroys it in ultimate carnage. Overall, I think the Dwemer would be able to handle the Thracian Plague over the long term, and unfortunately, the glimmer of hope that the other races had gets brushed to the wayside under the sheer power of the Dwemer's genius. If we moved further in the timeline to the U2703 of the First Era, we arrive at a Tamriel that in the real timeline is invaded by Akavir. In the real timeline, it takes a great effort to repel the invasion, and it's only thanks to the Dragonborn Reman that it is thwarted. Whereas in this alternate timeline, the Akaviri invasion force finds that it is no match for a technologically advanced Dwemer Empire and is easily repelled. In the years after, there is no reason to believe that the Dwemer could not easily conquer all of Tamriel with their advanced empire and their giant superweapon robot in the form of the Numidium. After all, in the real timeline, the Numidium was key to Tiber Septim's conquest of Tamriel, so in this alternate timeline, by the end of the First Era, year 2920, we have a Dwemer empire that rules all all of Tamriel, with all other races as blind slaves or vassal settlements allowed the small mercy of a serf-like existence above ground. Who knows what technological marvels the Dwemer could achieve. I wouldn't be surprised if they started making their own clockwork worlds, so for Sil style, fashioning themselves as gods of a new perfect world. Simulations within simulations, worlds within worlds, all kinds of crazy Dwemer shenanigans can happen from here. Perhaps it was best that the Dwemer vanished that fateful day at Red Mountain. Otherwise, this could have been the future in store for Tamriel. 
neat if you're a dwarf, not so good if you're literally any other race. Of course, this whole alternate timeline experiment was based upon a Dwemer success at the Battle of Red Mountain. And once again, due to the contradictory nature of the Dragon Break that occurred at the point in the real timeline, it's incredibly hard to discern which series of events is the truest. Regardless, it would have been a very boring video if the Dwemer didn't vanish, but they just lost and faded from existence anyways. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, an alternate timeline where the Dwemer did not vanish, a version where they would likely reach the stars and invent every technological marvel you can think of. A very bronze world. Not my ideal Tamriel by any means, but it was a fun thought experiment. Let me know what you think of this alternate timeline. Sound cool to you? I guess it might if you love dystopian futures, but in my books, I'm glad they disappeared for good. Thanks so much for watching guys. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet. Like the video if you enjoyed, subscribe for more, and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.